Okay, so we're going to discuss right now spot colors, which we did a lot. Um, we discussed a lot in the print examples you saw. We're also going to discuss the difference between, <coughs> excuse me, line art and something called raster art. And I'm going to go over it fairly quickly because we had this big conversation um, with all the printed material. But I just want you to know that it's here at, as part of your lecture for this unit. So the first thing I want to show you is um, what a vector image looks like when you're looking at it in Illustrator. And vector images are images that are created, as Sunny just said a second ago, based on mathematical equations. So kind of like Thomas is describing this binary program you said. Um, vector images are created through something called Bezier curves. And these Bezier curves essentially put an anchor point down at an XY coordinate on a page. And that XY coordinate is then defined with a curve. And it's those curves and the relationship of each XY coordinate, each vector point to vector point, is what defines the vector image in Illustrator. So you can see here that the image has little anchors and it has little handles. So if I'm in Illustrator, so I've launched Illustrator here, and Illustrator works like InDesign, you can create a workspace for it like you do in InDesign. So I went back to the Essentials workspace. And same thing like in InDesign, you can set up your preferences so you can do, create your um, units and in increments in InDesign right here, just like in, I'm sorry, in Illustrator, just like in InDesign. So I'm going to work in inches, say OK. And if I make a new document in Illustrator, you know what I think? I wanted my screen to be captured further above, but I can't. Oh well. Um, so in the Illustrator, you go to File, New to create a new document. And it's somewhat of a familiar dialog box here for you. Here's a tabloid setup. I can just go to a letter setup. And again, it's tall or it's wide. I'll make a wide one. And what I want you to see is there's a pen tool in Illustrator right here. And what you do, let me. Here's my fill box with color, just like in InDesign. I'll fill it with none. And here's my stroke box. I'll leave my stroke black. And my default stroke weight, if you look up at the top, is one point. Um, if I click and I drag, I've created a vector point, and I've created the curve with it. And if I click and drag over here and pull, hold my mouse down and pull, I've created a curve line. Okay, that's it. So if I were to write um, my name, I'll, let me come back here, let me hit delete and get rid of what I just did. Go back to the pen tool. If I were to write my name and I were to want to draw the letter V for Vicky, I, I'm just creating straight lines. I'm not pulling or dragging. I've only got straight lines. These lines have no handles, as you can see. And I've done this by creating one, two, three, four, I don't know, you count them, how many vector points? What's that? Seven. Thank you. <laughs> You're faster than I am. If I wanted to make an O, one of the ways of drawing an illustrator, just so you know, you're not going to really draw with original artwork until later if you want to, if you're game for it. Um, mostly what we're going to focus on is colors and tints, but I want you to see what vectors look like. If I were to draw a circle, for example, I would click and I would pull and create a handle. If I hold my shift key down, it'll be a constrained um, curve. And if I click here and pull and create a new handle, notice I'm created a curved line. And if I click <coughs> here and pull, I've created handles to create my curves. And click here, pull, and I can create a circle. And you see that little circle that shows up on my pen tool? That means I'm going to join my last vector point to this one, and I'm going to create a closed shape. Whoops. I clicked too hard, and I um, ended up deleting it. Let me do that again. There. Now, yeah, pulling. So I've created an egg, right? Um, and if you want to view what this looks like in um, just the vector outlines, you go to View and Outline, and you can see, because obviously there's no color in this, but I drew it what it looks like. If I 
marquee with my black arrow, if I marquee both of these shapes and I go to my fill and I fill it with some color like this blue, I must be still in outline mode. So I filled it with blue. This is what it looks like filled with blue. You have to make it active to fill a color. And if I want to view it in outline mode, that's just looking at the skeleton of the vector graphic. Okay? So that's Illustrator. Whereas if you're in Photoshop, um, it'll show up in a lecture. You're going to be looking at pixels, not vector lines. And that'll show up in, a, in part of the lecture. So the reason why vector graphics are so valuable um, is it's something, and here's a keyword, and trust me, you want to learn this keyword inside and out because it's worth about 100 points on your final, which is, <laughs> I got your attention, right? Um, which is the word is resolution independent, right here. The advantages of vector artwork is it's resolution independent, which means that I can blow this up or shrink it down without losing any image quality whatsoever because it's a mathematical equation. If I draw this, you know, if I draw this image at an inch in size and I want that V to cover the side of a building, I say blow this up seven zillion percent and I still have those same seven vector points that Thomas counted. That's it. That's all it took. So my file size doesn't increase. It's just a mathematical equation that you give it the formula to increase in size. So vector graphics are resolution independent, which means they have no resolution. The resolution um, is reliant on whatever output device you send it to. Now, because it's resolution in independent and because it's all mathematical equations, um, it's a small file, Ryan, it's a small file size. It stays a small file size. And um, like I already said, you can resize it without losing quality. Where if you have a Photoshop document, whatever you have captured in your Photoshop document or your raster image, um, that is the quality you've built your image with. If you blow that image up, you're only, um, it's called interpolating, but you're interpolating your image and you're going to lose quality. The more you blow it up, the more fuzzy, chunky, rastery it looks. You guys have all seen that on web images, right? Okay. So the only challenge with vector artwork um, in the past, I'll say, is the fact that vector artwork is a postscript um, application, which means that Adobe developed a, a page description language, and it's called PostScript. And PostScript requires something to convert that information in order to print it out successfully. And so therefore, if you send, I think I had this conversation with you before, if you send an Illustrator file to your printer that has no brain in it, to your little, like these are laser printers, they're big computers. They have RAM. They have random access memory in it. So therefore, they have PostScript software that can take your PostScript file and convert it um, into the, the page that it was defined as. It has the software, sorry, that wasn't very articulate. It has, um, it has PostScript software that will print your image properly. If you don't have that um, printer, like a home printer, if you don't have a random access memory and um, something to convert your PostScript information, your files won't print properly. They'll print low resolution. They'll look okay. They'll look kind of, um, they'll be a low resolution preview of what they think it should look like. Pixelated? Yeah, they might be pixelated, exactly. Yeah, Thomas? You can still use a pen tool in Photoshop, though, right? Yeah, it's Photoshop, but that's essentially creating a vector graphic in Photoshop. So it's not what Photoshop's about. So I'm a purist. Understand that, understand, remember how old I am, right? I'm so old, that all the softwares did not, uh, did not overlap. So InDesign used to be Quark, and that was where you'd take your graphics and blend them with text. In Photoshop, you'd handle your continuous tone images and photos. And in Illustrator, you'd handle your illustration. Now. You can use that pen tool in InDesign, Illustrator, and Photoshop. And it's still a vector graphic when you do so. So the paintbrush would then be in like a VPI, wouldn't be in vector graphic? 
vector. So the paintbrush in Photoshop would be about pixels and not about a vector graphic. Okay. However, totally digressing here for you, um, Illustrator has paintbrushes that are beautiful. You could get a watercolor effect. Oh, beautiful. You, I, didn't, I didn't see it in there until one, so I'm used to working in Photoshop. Well, I, I am digressing just for kicks here. Here's a brush in um, Illustrator. And notice that, yeah, whole jar full. And notice, for example, if I draw with this one, let me just click on this brush, um, and I use, um, let's say, this brush tool. And let me view this in preview mode so you can see it with color. I just stroked that whole thing. My stroke became that brush. And if I draw with that brush, there's my brush. And if I'm in Illustrator and I load my brush library, this is sophisticated, you guys. This Wait, is just, how did I do that? Was that so fun, yeah. right? Yeah. I know, it was fun. Um, okay, I'll show you one second. I'm in, in a brush tool in Illustrator. Oh, okay. This is totally digressing from our lecture, but we tend to do that, don't we? Um, I'm going to open a brush library, and I can use, um, let me try artistic brushes, and let me try the watercolor brush. Because you think of Illustrator as now just lines and sharp angles, but look at these beautiful watercolor brushes. You'll never go back to Photoshop again, which is there. There's, um, here, let me click on this. There. Let me select all, Command A, select all, delete. Let me take my black and let me make it some color. Let me make it. A red, so you can see how watercolory this is. And let me pick a nice watercolory brush here. And I'm just dragging my mouse around to those little squiggles. And there's my watercolor. I know you're excited now, aren't you? You can't wait to dive into that illustrator. And if we view this based in outline mode, it's I just did that. I just drew a little wiggly line. That was it. Um, Anyway, so it's still a vector graphic. It's just that Illustrator went so far now that they have all these beautiful effects. And it's created with a vector graphic with, you know, Bezier curves and um, the mathematical equation. But there's all these special effects. And being that I'm not a computer genius, I don't know how to describe what they do. Well, this can scale up and scale down because it's still a mathematical equation to accomplish it. But if you did that in Photoshop, if you did this in Photoshop and that was the size of your image, you couldn't blow it up. It would be chunky and rasterized. But because it's an illustrator, it's not. So very exciting, right? I think so, too. OK, so back to this um, printing your image. So the only disadvantage, again, to Illustrator is it's a PostScript language, and you need a PostScript printer to print it to for it to print properly. However. Can anybody guess? I bet Alyssa can, because her ears perked up. Can you guess what I could do to my Illustrator file that would let it print properly? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I bet you could figure it out. Could you export it? Oh, sorry. Can you export it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what would I export it as, do you think? Um, yeah, exactly. So, so Alyssa and Thomas were right on the right wavelength. Yes, you can export, you can save an Illustrator file. Actually, all you have to do is save it. You save your Illustrator file as a PDF, a portable document format. And remember that a PDF embeds all your information in your file. Remember, anybody can see it. So if you save your Illustrator file as a PDF file, you don't need a PostScript printer anymore. So you just took away the only disadvantage to Illustrator. Okay. All right, so let's um, close this and let's come back to this lecture. So we've talked about the difference. Let's talk a little bit about spot color. We looked at all the examples of the samples I gave you. And basically, um, spot color and vector graphics are often referred to as line art because they have no tonal gradations. And I find that confusing because if we look at this, we see tonal gradations. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a misnomer to describe it that way. But basically, it's not tonal gradations that are raster images. It's still a vector graphic. And so it's creating what they refer to as flat color. And so if you have a shape 
like this square and you fill it with that blue, it's, it's a mathematical equation. You have those four anchor points for the corners to create your square. You designate a color and it's just data information. You're not talking about each pixel by pixel of what color it is. So one of the advantages of Illustrator is you can maximize your designs, as you saw before, by using tints of a color. So for example, if I use magenta as my specific color, I can tint it by just designating a 30% tint for the color, which I think you've done in your assignments. I think you did it with um, those fall leaves assignments. Do you remember that? Not sure if you tinted them or not. But anyway, um, you tint the color and you get a lighter value of this saturated magenta. But how that happens is you're not watering down the color to make it a lighter tint and you're not adding white to it. What you're doing is when things are printed, they're printed with dots on the paper, which is referred to as a half tone. And when you print with dots, um, how close together and how big these dots are creates an illusion which creates a tint. It's called a screen tint because essentially to get these dots the software applies a screen to it and it used to be of course when we talk about all that film work we used to do they literally would put a acetate layer between the film to screen artwork when they photographed your film negatives. So the best way to describe it is picture the screen door or the screen on your windows you know, there's areas where the wire is, and then there's areas where there's the holes in the screen. Everybody get that? Do you know what I mean, Sana? You know what a screen is, right? On a window? Me? Yeah. No. Oh, me and Louise. You look like somebody in my following class. So, you know what a screen is on a window, right? A window covering. So if you open your window, no bugs fly in. It's oh, yeah. a screen. Right. Okay. Or a screen door on a sliding door. Right? All right. So essentially a screen is the same thing. There's the wire that makes up the screen and the holes in the screen, the fine mesh. So if the ink only went through the holes in the screen and you pulled the screen away, you'd see a bunch of dots. Yeah? Everybody follow that? Okay. So that's how tints are made. That's how they used to be made when you did it by using film work and doing um, all of this manually, not digitally. <laughs> digitally now, you designate a tint when your file is output digitally for printing. They break your file into um, these halftone dots. And it's the size of the dot and how close they are together um, that creates this tint. Does that make sense to everybody? Yuki, does that make sense to you? Yeah? Okay. All right. You already know what the swatch books look like, but here's something very critical that I don't want you to miss, which is, I'm even going to write it on the board so you can see. When you specify ink colors in Illustrator, you're going to open an ink swatch book, you're going to pick the number of the color you like, let's say it's that metallic silver you saw on all the artwork I passed out there, and that number happens to be PMS. Pantone Matching System 877. All right, when you pick your color, it's either going to say 877U for uncoated paper, or it's going to say 877, it's going to say Pantone, 877C for coated paper. Because it's a computer and you're picking your inks at the computer, your computer sees this entire number including the U, so it sees that as one ink swatch. If you by accident pick PMS 877C after you picked the one with the U, it's going to think you have two colors, right? Two different names. Even though you know it's 877 and it looks the same, so be careful as you start working with these spot colors that you always pick the exact same name. Hi, John. Morning. That you always pick the exact same name. So I always, I always, just for continuity, pick coded colors. Just not because the color is going to look different on the screen, not because the color is going to look different um, anywhere. It's the same can of ink. 
just goes on a, a coat of paper or a coat of paper. Yeah, Ben. But when so when you send that to the print shop, though, don't you have to specify if that's what you're going to do? Um, not the ink, but the paper. What happens is, and I'll show you this in a second. Um, what happens is, you specify the ink, you build your files with the ink you want, and your files will show the printer what ink you selected. They'll know. And then you'll also tell the print shop what paper you want to print on. So even if I print, I select 877C for coded, and I want to print on an uncoded paper, it doesn't impact my artwork, if that's your question. It doesn't matter. It's still the same can of ink. It's just going on, you know, a different sheet of paper. Okay? Um, so here, what this is really saying is, when you pick your colors, they're going to be called Pantone coded, um, computer video coded, they're called CVC colors, or uncoded U, or um, forget the process for the moment. But just make sure that you're consistent with your naming conventions as you select your inks. Um, and then obviously, you know, let's say you created a design that was one color that was done in black. You don't have to redo all your artwork. You could tell your printer, you know what, this was created in one color black, but I want you to print it with red ink um, or magenta ink, and that's what would happen. They take your black um, design, your one color design, and just by changing the ink, you're going to change the whole look of the artwork. And then you had lots of examples of two color printing. Black is a color, by the way. So black would be one of your colors here, and then lavender would be a second. Or here is still two color printing with lavender and pink. So you can kind of see the effects. So the whole goal here is to become um, clear about how to work with these colors to your advantage to get a lot of mileage out of it. Then the other thing is, oh man, that doesn't look very good, does it? So you saw that folder in real life. It's much prettier than that distorted image. Um, but again, when you design things, you want to design with tints of the colors to get a lot of mileage out of the ink you're using. So here's a logo design that was yellow and green. There were no tints in it. But on the back side of the sheet, we printed little stripes with like a 20% yellow tint to kind of have fun with the letterhead design. And here's a video on um, inks, which I find pretty interesting. So let me pause my and close that up. And actually, let me come back to that. Just one thing. Notice um, talking with designing with color, with flat color, meaning a spot color. You saw large solids in the designs I showed you earlier where we had that flood of silver on the back of the stationery, for example, or that big red in that um, invitation, right? Or you saw tints of the color in the design of, let's say, the newsletter. And you saw a variety of color blends, you know, different percentages. And you certainly saw reverse type, like the white type showing through that field of black on those cards that we saw. So all of these details um, are important to keep in mind when you design things. And um, you got to see, I don't need to talk to you about this because you got to see, I'm, I don't need to tell you about this text because you got to see firsthand by looking at printed samples what was appealing to you and not appealing about uh, different colors and their tints when you design. Yeah, let's see what else we got here. Um, this is a conversation about color separation. And actually, I'm not going to read through this lecture because I'm going to show you um, color separations. But what I want to what I want to call your attention to is this. Here's, let's say, the cover of a newsletter or an article. It's called a composite image. It means it's blending the magenta ink that's specified and the black ink that's specified. And what happens is, is when these get printed, each color gets a different printing cylinder for that ink. I think you might remember that from one of the videos we saw earlier on printing. So in order to do that, you have to separate out your two printing plates. And that's referred to as a color separation. And as you see, a color separation doesn't show up in color. It's 
it's going to show up in black or it's going to show up in the in how the metal plate gets etched but that color separation is going to indicate where um, that color is used in the artwork that you're choosing to print so notice that everything that's in solid magenta on this little um, newsletter cover is a solid here and that pink that's in this header here is remember it's those little teeny dots that create the illusion of pink but it's still that magenta ink so these are two printing plates you're looking at two color separations the magenta on the left and everything in black on the right does that make sense for everybody okay and let's scroll yeah, down here too. I'm sorry no, with silk screen designs too. absolutely you do it with silk screen designs exactly now um, one of the things we did talk about earlier is when you make color separations, um, often you don't do it in film anymore. They don't do film anymore. Most printers do what's called this, direct to plate. Um, and that means that they're not making film and then burning a printing plate. They're literally digitally etching into the metal printing plate that gets printed. Everybody follow that? Do you guys want to see what a printing plate looks like? Okay. Yeah, it's like a piece of foil, Sunny said. Yep, it is. Uh, here's a printing plate. Here it is. So you can see that this piece of metal has an image on it. And wherever the image is, that's what the ink is going to be drawn to. And wherever the image isn't, there will be no ink there. So this locks into a cylinder. You see the holes? It locks into these little pins that stick up. And it locks into a cylinder. Obviously, it doesn't overlap itself. And it rolls and grabs the ink and grabs the paper. And you, you saw the video on it. Here's a copper printing plate. So like I said, um, this doesn't have an image on it. It used to be that film was made. Actually, that is the image here. It used to be that film negatives were made and that the plate itself has an emulsion on it, if you're familiar with photography, which is a light sensitive chemical. And you expose, you set the negative and sandwich it, and you expose it to light. It's like photography. And wherever um, light is exposed, yeah, it's like silk screen. Right, same as silk screen. So if you understand the silk screen concept or, or photography, wherever there's exposure, that will be what gets burned onto the plate. Wherever there isn't exposure, it, you rinse the plate and the emulsion will wash off there, won't, won't adhere, which is, um, which is, this is not direct to plate. This is burning your film onto the plate, onto the emulsion. Nowadays, they don't even bother with negatives. I mean, all that cost I talked to you at the beginning of the semester about all those negatives, we don't do them. It's all direct to plate. So we make changes up to the very last sec second on a job, let's say, before the plate is burned. And um, it happened in, probably most printers don't do film anymore. And that happened, Sunny said, in the last 10 or 15 years, I'm saying. Most printers probably eliminated it about 10 years ago. But some, you know, it's expensive, all this equipment. So they kind of phase it out. Yeah. He's got all these dates down. He says in 04, the company can work for a change. But anyway, so direct to plate means there's an emulsion on the plate still, and it's digitally, um, it's digitally created so that it's not a negative that's burned against it. Okay? So, so that's direct to printing plate. And what's really important for you, besides proofing um, before a printing plate is made, obviously is to view when you create your artwork what your separations look like and you're going to learn how to do that today. The other thing is um, when you were looking up all these printed materials like this one it had on it color bars, it had on it crop marks like you're seeing right here on your screen in front of you on the corners. These crop marks tell the printer where something trims. The registration marks show up on every printing plate so you can register your color plate to plate to plate so you know everything's in proper alignment. 
And those are generated, you've generated them already in InDesign without really knowing what they're for. Um, but as you come to understand the printing process, you'll start to learn more. And you also need to set up bleeds, which you've already done. And bleeds are obviously when you're designing something, you want your artwork to exceed the boundary of your trim in order for it to print beyond the boundary of your trim so you can get a clean edge of color when the piece is trimmed. Everybody's familiar with those terms. Crop marks, bleed, um, trim marks, yeah? Registration marks. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see if I missed anything here. Now, if you're not in class and you need help with what I'm going to review for you, how to create color, um, spot colors in Illustrator, this is just a tutorial that walks you through it step by step, but I'm going to demo it for you and introduce our next assignment. And it tells you how to save your files in Illustrator. So, like I said, if you're not in the class, it's all here. And let's see what the last one is. Here's how to create spot colors in InDesign also, which is different than Illustrator. And I'm going to demo that as well. So let me move forward with this and show you what our next assignment is. So here is the Adobe Illustrator assignment. And you're going to download something called ClipArt, which is artwork that was already created by somebody else that's a complete vector graphic and the goal of that artwork. So if you have your laptop open, you might want to just close it and pay attention to what I'm saying so you get it. So you might want to close the lid of your laptop. That would be great. Um, so you're going to have two assignments. One is you're going to download a skunk illustration and you're going to download a chicken illustration. And the goal of it is to learn how to work with two spot colors to create an interesting design. So understand that I've looked at this more years than you could ever imagine. So the more interesting your design, the happier I am, OK? You also know that you can load text into InDesign. So the text and the illustrations are provided for you. And then if you want to know what to do with this assignment, first off, obviously, you're going to read through all of this. and. Um, if you click on Clip Art Assignment Instructions, here are very, very specific instructions. This is, you're, remember, you're not in the book anymore. So now here is the instructions for how to execute this assignment. Um, you know how to use text wraps. We've already talked about text wraps, correct? You know, we're back to, oh, this takes you to an Adobe TV lecture on how to do text wraps, if you don't remember. Um, so there's lots of tutorials here for you. It looks like it didn't take me to the right link, though. But you can Google it. I might update that for you. And um, then it tells you what the goal of this project is, which is to manipulate vector artwork in Illustrator and use pan the Pantone color library and screen tints to transform the artwork. And then you're going to work with your illustrations in Illustrator and then you're going to save them in Illustrator. And then you're going to place them in InDesign. And you're going to place the text in InDesign and set the text. Now, finally, OK, finally, there is no template for you to match. There is no point size somebody told you to do. There is no font I've specified. Now there's a little creativity with this, OK? So, um, I'm not going to read off of this because I know what the goal is here. So this is your guide for the assignment. If you don't know how to do something, you should click on these links and it'll take you to a page to help you. And if you want to know how you get graded on this, it's super specific. You're creating a two-page document in InDesign. You're creating two color layouts. It's 30 points per page for each layout. You need to spell check and proofread your text. There are typos and errors in it. You need to make sure it reads correctly. And then you need to format it in a way that shows me that you know how to use letting and point size and font usage and alignment. Ryan's nodding for me. And right? And <laughs> thank you. And, um, and then you're going to convert your InDesign document 
into a PDF file and have all marks and bleeds set up for you. On your document, everybody loses 10 points right here. On your document, put your name on your document, put the Pantone colors you used in your document, and name the file format of the image that you placed in your document. And there's two file formats that you can save Illustrator in. One file format is this, an EPS file, which stands for Encapsulated Postscript. And the reason you would choose to save a file as an encapsulated postscript file is not all applications can see Illustrator files, native Illustrator files. Some applications like Quark or um, some vendors that I might use who might create labels or something for me might prefer an EPS file format and you can save a vector file as an EPS and encapsulate PostScript. I'll show you how. And I prefer to save my files because I work in InDesign. I prefer to save them as a native Illustrator file because InDesign loves native in, um, Illustrator files. So either file format is fine, but in your document, in your pages, using the Pantone colors, because remember you're going to create only a two color design, make sure you add that information. So then the next step you're going to do, here's something called mixed color swatches. I didn't show you that in this class, did I? Super cool. Totally fun. I'll show you that. And the other thing is before you submit this assignment to make sure you do it correctly, you need to check your separations. And again, there's links on how to do that. The other thing is there's something called edit original. I think I showed you once in this class what that is, but I'll demonstrate that. Be sure to package all of your artwork as well. Um, and I know you know how to do that. So let me just get started with this for you. Let me go back to the assignment page. Let me download, um, you know what, I always do the chicken. Well, that's okay. I, I'm going to hold down um, your control key and you can say, let me, let me just click on this and it should just download my file. So I clicked on it. It says open with Illustrator or I can save the file. So I can choose either way. Let me just save the file so we have it downloaded on the computer. Went into the Downloads folder. If I locate the Downloads folder, there it is. Um, okay, show me the Downloads folder. And if I view by date, modified, notice it showed up right at the top here. Now I can just drag my chicken, my chick file, my AI file, into the Illustrator icon and it opens an Illustrator. Let me close this one here. Okay, don't save it. So let's, the first thing I do, particularly when it comes to um, clip art images, is there's a few things I do with them because we don't know how the artist designed it. So first I just view it. I go to view and I view it in ally mode and I see what it's made up of. And I see that there's this shape and there's rays of the sun that are behind the chicken. Now, we can also, there's layers in Illustrator, and we can also see if the artist designed this on multiple layers, which they didn't. So every... How do you do the back and white thing? Oh, I went to View, Preview, View, Outline. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing as in Illustrator. You just kind of talk, I mean, in, as in InDesign, talk out loud. It really kind of... If you say, oh, I don't know what I'm looking for, I want to view this differently, you can find your headers and get a sense of it. Um, so I'm going to view back in preview mode. Then the other thing I do is I go to my black arrow, my selection tool, which grabs an object, and I click on it anywhere. And what happens is, is everything becomes active. So what that means is, because everything became active, all these little pieces, like if I try and grab this little black, you know, clucky sound indicator here. Um, everything's active, so I can't grab one item. So what that means is I probably want to go to Object and Ungroup Things. And then I click on it again, and look, I can just grab that little black thing, right? So the other thing is I want to start, I'm, my goal with these full color Illustrator files is to use screen tints and only two spot colors. So Illustrator loads spot colors differently. You go to Window, and like I said, it's in those lectures online for you. 
but you go to Windows Swatch Library and the library you want is a color book library and you want a Pantone library in color books and I always select Pantone solid coded and the keyword here for all of you because if you don't select this word you'll regret it because um, you'll have to redo your work you want solid and not solid to process you want solid coded so I would stick with Pantone solid coded for your color and then what happens is, is it loads this entire library of that entire swatch book of Pantone colors. And notice there's a little teeny spot in the corner, which means you have a spot color. So if I use this pullout menu here in Illustrator, I can view these as a list view so I could see their names and numbers. And you can see that these are spot colors. They have a spot indicator here. So I can scroll down and pick a couple colors. And when you create this, pick colors that are kind of opposite um, because it's fun to blend colors that are like complementary colors. So let me show you the swatch library. Let me tear off this swatch library. And I'm going to cl click on that green and notice it loaded in my swatch library. And I'll pick um, something very different than my green. I'll pick this magenta. And it loaded in my swatch library. And then I'm going to close this so I don't make a mistake and choose these by accident. And then I have these two swatches. Now I can pull up my color palette, like there's a color palette in InDesign. And I can go right here, click on that magenta color. Notice I have that as a stroke active and a fill black. But I can use this magenta color and I can use the slider bar and I can make a 50% tint of that magenta and I could just drag that swatch and put it in my swatch library. And it gave me a ton. I can get a ton of tints in my library built for me. There's also something in Illustrator called a color guide, which you would find under Window Color Guide, right? And the color guide gives you all these tints of that color. So I could click on that where the spot is. Don't pick it where there's no spot because you want what's called spot color. I can hold my shift key down and I could drag all these tints and add them to my swatch library. I could click on my green swatch, select all these tints right here. But this one's a solid one. Don't pick the solid because you'll make a duplicate ink swatch. So skip the solid one. Come here to this one. Hold the shift key down and I can drag all these to my swatch library. Now if I run my cursor over them, that's a solid green, solid magenta, 50% tint, another 50% tint of my magenta, and look what happens because I duplicated it. It gave me that one after the name. We don't want the one after the name because the computer will see that as a second color. So I'm going to drag it and delete it because I had a duplicate. So check that you know it just says 683C and a percentage of 683, that it doesn't have a 1 after it. And then here's my green, it is 100%. Here's a tint, another tint. You see what I built? Okay. So what happens here is I now have this whole library of color tints without going to a whole lot of effort, right? And if I zoom in on this chicken, I can do things pretty efficiently. I can do it John has lots of shortcuts he wants to give you, um, and I'm not going to tell you them yet because I think it's cheating. So um, <laughs> he, he tries to get you guys off the hook so nobody makes a mistake, but I want you to learn how to build these files. So I'm going to use my black arrow, and I'm going to select the body of this rooster, and I can, or chicken, and it's now, oops, it's stroked. I don't want to stroke it. I want to fill it with that magenta. And I can, now what I want you to see is I dragged that body of the rooster off the rooster and notice that that magenta sat on a larger shape of the rooster or chicken. And um, so I click on the black and let's say I make it green. See that? And then the wing is a color. Now you can use white, but don't use black. That would be the paper showing through there. If I bring this back here and put it back in place for the rooster, you can see how the magenta sits on the green, right? Everybody gets that. Now, 
it's super fussy. Um, what you'll find is you can select, let's say, the yellow, and I can make that a tint to the green. And I can select this orange color and make it a pink, or I can hold my shift key down and select everything I see as orange. See that little orange between the tail there? It's very hard to grab. Did you see I grabbed the rooster body instead? So there's a way that is simpler to do that. And also see right here, it's where everybody loses points. See that little piece there of color? Um, that's the ray of the sun that sits behind the rooster. That's really hard to see. So let me change this to, um, let me change it to white, right? But what's going to happen is um, you still are going to have that little orange piece. So a way to do that differently might be, you can do this. I can select on the ray of the sun, and in Illustrator I can go to Select, and I can select the same fill color, and everything that's orange, I can group them. So whenever I make revisions to it, um, they're all selected, and I can change this to be some light green color. Right? And I can select the yellow and make it pink. And I can take that row of a crop and I can go to select same fill color. And I can object group them and make them a different color. So the goal here is to build something that's attractive, which is not what this is turning out to be. Um, <laughs> Um, to build something that's attractive that's using only two spot colors. So go to select, same, fill color. Now, as long as it's ungrouped, I can select something. Um, I can select my shapes. The black arrow will select a whole shape. And if you want to grab only an anchor point, the white arrow, and in this case you probably won't, the white arrow can grab just one anchor point. Let me select just that one anchor point. I'm sorry, using the white arrow, which is my direct selection tool. And I can change the shape of that by moving that one anchor point. In this case, I wouldn't mess around with it for you. The idea isn't to distort the art. The idea is to um, set up your artwork where you're creating only two colors. OK, and then let me select my blue. Let me go to select same fill color. And now, I'm just playing with my tints. I'm grabbing a shape. Here is select, same fill color with my black. And I'm going to make all my black um, magenta. And if I think I'm done, and I think I've done all my two colors here, I can check it. I can go to Window, Separation Preview. And what happens is it loads all the ink colors that I've used. And if I turn on Overprint, it now sees all my colors. And this is how you can tell what's on what printing plate. So if I turn off my green printing plate, I turn off the eye here, and I can see where I use the green. If I turn off the eye for the magenta, so I can see these are going to print as process color. So I would have a six color print job because I have these four process colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and I don't want them. So instead, I'm going to go back in here and select these and change them. And um, you get a sense of this, right? So let's see. And let's say I'm going to select that color, same fill color, and change it. And let me finish this up really quickly for you. Um, and let me save it. Let me pretend I think that I'm good. And I've picked all my colors and everything is great. So then I'm going to save my file. And as I told you, you can save an Illustrator file two ways. You can save it as an AI file, a native Illustrator file, or you can save it as an EPS file. So when I save my Illustrator file, I go to File, Save As. I'm going to call it Chicken. And um, I'm going to call it PMS. So I know it's my spot colors. And I'm going to save this. Um, I'll save this in the work folder. In, and I suggest you make a folder and call it uh, clip art or um, illustrator file or something like that with your name so you know where to save it. 
and you can package it. And I'm going to save my document. Then in InDesign, I'm going to create a new document in InDesign. I'm going to go File, New, New Document. And I'm going to build two pages. I can, you can set your margins at whatever makes you happy. You set your bleed to the default, with it, which is an eighth of an inch. You can decide whether you want to build columns or not in your document. But let me set this up pretty quickly for you. And here, I want you to look at my swatches in InDesign. Now I'm in InDesign. I have a new document. Notice these are my default swatches, and they're all a CMYK mix, process color mix. You all follow that? Um, when I go to file and I place that chicken that I saved down here, pay attention to where you save stuff. So I place the chicken. My cursor is going to load with the graphic. And I can click and it places at 100%, or I can click and drag and place it at an increased percentage. Look how chunky it is. It's chunky because the display performance for this is um, typical instead of high quality. As long as it's linked, it's always going to look great when you go to high quality. Then, when I'm in InDesign, I want you to notice that now, by loading that graphic, placing it, it also added those two color swatches to work with in InDesign. So what that allows me to do is if I click off of the chicken and I go to my rectangle tool and I create a window and I go to object, arrange, and I send the window to the back, I can take this burgundy tint and I can make it a 10% tint and I've got a soft pink background to my graphic, right? I could come back here, I could click off of that so it's not active. I could come back here, draw another window, and create a little stripe, and I could fill it with solid green, and I could marquee um, my two rectangles, go to Object Arrange, send it back. And my um, chicken, because it's an Illustrator file, a native Illustrator file, it automatically will have a transparent background for me. Sometimes when you save things as an EPS file, which is why EPS is a little fussy, it might give it a white background. You have to specify transparent. So if you want to avoid that, I suggest staying with a native Illustrator file. Now, um, if I want to check it, let me save my file because I've made some progress. And again, I'm going to go back to that same folder where I saved the clip art and name this as clip um, torf and it has the suffix for InDesign. I save it. If I want to go to preview mode, I can see what it looks like. It's starting to get kind of pretty, right? Um, what I want to double check, though, is I want to go to Window, Output. It's a different location in InDesign than it is in Illustrator. But Window, Output, Separation, Preview. And again, I can do that same thing and make sure I have only two colors, because black is a color. And if I turn off my CMYK, right now my process color, nothing should disappear. So look at the chicken and see if anything disappears. And it does. So you can see I built those poorly. So if I turn off my two spot colors, I can now see what I have to fix in my Illustrator file. Now, the cool thing about working in InDesign here is there's a shortcut to this. If I click on this graphic and I hold my Control key down, I can go to Edit Original, and it's going to go back and open up my Illustrator file for me without me leaving InDesign. It's going to launch the Illustrator file, and I can go here to these browns, and I can go to Select, Same, Fill Color, and change them to, I don't know, green. Whoops. Change them to green. There we go. And again, before I leave Illustrator, since I know I have some issues with my colors, I can go to Window Separation Preview, turn off that spot color, turn off that spot color, and everything should disappear, except for the roof of my little barn. So that means I'm going to highlight the roof of my little barn, turn it into a spot color. Now I see nothing on my page, which means I did this properly, which means I only use two spot colors so I won't have any problems at the print shop. If I don't build this properly and I send my file to the print shop 
and I've started paying them for working with my file and they say you built it incorrectly, they're going to stop, they're going to call me, they're going to say, do you want to revise your file, which is going to throw off your deadline, right? It's going to take up a couple days, or do you want us to fix it for you, which I'm going to pay 150 bucks an hour for them to fix it for me. And so the idea is double check your work before you ever get there. Never, if you can help it, send a bad file to the print shop because it's time and money. Okay, so I, I've created this. Um, all I have to do is save it. It resaved my file. I can close it and watch what happens. Watch the brown when I click on my InDesign file. See how it updated it automatically to green? So now if I turn off my two spot colors, nothing shows here which means my file's built properly with only two spot colors. Now the only other thing that goes along with this um, assignment is text. So here if I click on the text box from Moodle, I can highlight my text here or I can download my text. I'm just going to highlight it and copy it. Command C, copy. And then I'm going to go back to my InDesign document. I'm going to create a text box right here. I'm going to paste my text, and you all know how to do text wrap. Now, what's the problem if I turn off my spot color here? My text is black. Black is a color. So I'm going to have to convert my text to some readable color here. And so all I have to do is highlight my text, all of it, select all, highlight it, and again, I can make it um, dark green or magenta, and I think I'll pick the green. Whoops, not stroke. Fill. Don't stroke small text. The other thing is, <coughs> consider your design. Maybe you decide that you want to take the chicken, you want to go to window text wrap, you want to apply a text wrap. Well, it's going to wrap around the bounding box of the Illustrator file. If you want it to wrap around the chicken, you can select um, wrap around object shape, go to contour options, detect edges, <coughs> and now it created a little vector wrap around the chicken, and I can increase the size of how much wrapping it's doing. Can you all see that? Which is what you've been working with. The other thing is I'm going to take my text box, and it's your call for how you want to lay it out. I do want you to have some lovely, wonderful headline for me. Um, and you can lay this out any way you want. So um, I'm going to call my chicken Rise and Shine. Cluck. Click. Not cluck, huh? C L U C K. And highlight my text. And again, it's your call for how you want to set this up. I'm going to make the headline color burgundy. I'm going to make my font onyx because I am running out of time and I don't want to scroll through it all with you. And um, you decide how you want this to align. Make sure that you use, um, you specify your letting. Don't use default letting. And make sure all my text is highlighted. Don't use default letting. You also might decide that you don't want it to wrap like that and you might want to break up your lines exactly how you want. Or I might want to go to my paragraph panel and make this um, flush right. For my headline. And again, in my paragraph panel, I might want to add space after my headline, right? Um, I also might decide that I want to do this. Let me go to view normal. I might decide that I want to make a text box that stays within my margin guides. Let me do this right there. And I might decide that I want my text box to be two columns wide. So go to Object, Text Frame Options, two columns wide. And I want a gutter between them of a half an inch. OK. And so here's my first column right here on the left and um, my second column on the right. But I might decide that I want my headline text, if I click anywhere on my headline text, that I want my headline to span. Do you remember this? Span two columns? Did I show you this? This is my favorite new toy. Um, this is new to CS5. I can specify that my text, this headline text, 
um, spans not just um, one column because of this two column text box I have, but I can make it span across all my columns and look at what happened to my headline, right? Now, um, because of my text wrap, it's sitting on this side of my chicken, but let me, let me set up my document like this. Another thing, um, I actually don't like how this looks because it's on my green band, so maybe I'm going to set my text box kind of like that, right? Y'all with me on this? Now, the other thing is, is look at in here. There's lots of typos. There's weird slashes. There's bad spacing. There's merged words. In Illustrator, I mean, I'm sorry, in InDesign, you can go to Edit Spelling, and you can spell check your document, spell check the story or the document, and it'll spell it, check it for you. So that makes sense. But it's not going to get rid of things that don't make sense, like a slash. Okay? So be sure to spell check it. You get graded down for not um, spell checking your document. I'm running out of time, so I want to make sure I show you what to do here. You can also, for example, let me do one thing here. I can click on my chicken, hold my control key down, go to edit original, open my chicken, and I can marquee in Illustrator just the chicken, not the barn, not the grass, not the field. Hold my shift key down and select the wing of the chicken, which it didn't grab. And I'm going to copy that. Okay. I'm going to close this window. I'm going to create a new window in Illustrator, File New. Um, I'm going to edit paste what I copied. And now I have just my chicken, right? And maybe I want my chicken to be all green. Notice it brought in my spot colors into my new document. It did not bring my tints with me, though. I'd have to create a swatch library for that, and I'll show you that a different day. But I'm going to turn my chicken green here. I'm going to save this as um, Chick 2, PMS 2. Save it in there. OK. And in Illustrator, I can marquee my whole chicken. I can go to this rotation tool, which has a reflect tool like it does in Illustrator. I mean, I'm sorry, like it does in InDesign. And I can hold the Option key, and I get a little window. And I'm going to flop it, because I want it to face the other direction, right? And I'm going to save this, because I already saved the name. I'm going to save it again, and I'll show you why I did this. So I might decide that down here in my InDesign document, I'm going to click off of it. I'm going to go to Command-D, or File, Place. I'm going to find Chick 2. I'm going to open it. I'm going to make little teeny chickens marching across my page. I'm going to hold my Option key and my Shift key. And um, I have my chickens. They're going to breakfast, I think. Um, I can marquee this, select all my chickens, hold my Shift key down, and deselect my background and my text box, which accidentally got selected. These are all things you know. I can go to Object Layout, Align, and I can distribute my spacing horizontally. So they're spaced. Oh, and it aligned to margins. I don't want that. I want it to align to selection. Distribute spacing. Now they're equally spaced. And, you know, if I'm setting my text here, my type in this document, it's probably not going to be 12 point on default letting. It's probably going to be more like uh, 11 point on 14 point letting or something like that. And here's um, something cool, by the way. I've been setting up a book, and um, using this right here, I can line to baseline grid my two columns. So they space out this way or line that way. Um, it's not what I wanted to do. What's this one? Don't align to baseline grid. Where is it? I can base align both of them but not to baseline grid. Oh, well, I'll find it a different day. Um, but what I can do here is I can take my text box and I could just pull up the bottom to align these better, right? And I can raise this up. Watch out for overflow. I know this text so well. John and I, we've read it so many times. We know when you've 
major text run out. Also pay attention to the text wrap here. Don't show me that. That is majorly unattractive. So you might want to select all your text and you might choose to turn off hyphenation. You might decide to make this where typography is super large so it's more interesting to look at, right? It's your call. You get to design this how you want. Okay, you get in the flow of it? Yep. All right, one more thing I want to do before you leave is save your document. Um, package your document. If you have missing links, it'll tell you here. We haven't done packaging very much, have we? Um, packaging, you want to make sure that all your links look happy. If they're not happy, you'll be a, see a big red symbol there. It, they have to be linked in order for the graphics to print properly. If I went to my um, work folder and I go to the tour folder and I remove where this um, chicken file is placed, let me put it in that folder so I can't find it, look what happens to my link folder. I get a red stop sign because it can't find that graphic and it won't print properly. To relink it, you highlight it, you click the link, you locate it. I know where I put it, so um, I hit it in this folder. It finds it, it highlights it. Now look at, there's no missing symbols here. You want to make sure things are linked properly. You go to File Package. Nothing's missing, nothing's modified. I'm using two spot colors. I package my document. I'm going to save it again. Um, this says um, any instructions you want for the printer. And then again, I'm going to put it in my clip folder here. And I'm going to package it. This says don't steal the fonts. Hang on, I'm on a roll, Thomas, because we're running out of time. And, um, and then, um, Remember, remember what the package folder has in it, right? Do you want me to show you that? No? Okay. And then the other thing is you're going to um, create a PDF file, high quality print, put it in your package folder where the documents and fonts and native file is, and notice it carried my two links with me. It duplicated them, right? All right, let me go backwards here. Put your PDF file in your native folder, save your document, Make sure to select all printer's marks and use bleed settings. Export the document. Oh, I have overset on page one. I got to stop it because that means I need to fix it. See my overset right here? I thought I fixed that. Anyway, we'll try that again. Let me resave my document and let me save my document back in this package folder because this is the folder outside of the package folder is the document I'm working on. So I need to replace it in my package folder. Now I can create a PDF of it. And now I'm going to hit all marks and bleeds. Use bleed settings. I'm only going to say page one because I only have page one. And we'll look at it and show you what we're going to get. Here we go. And okay. Okay, Thomas, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask if you could fill with the gradient. Yes. Gradients in um, Illustrator and InDesign are fabulous. If you wanted, let's say, this background here, this tint background to be a gradient, um, from InDesign, there's a gradient panel here. Double click on it, pull up the gradient. I can take my swatches. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that so fast. I'm trying to hurry. I can drag this burgundy swatch here. And I can drag the green swatch here. I just have to be sure to drag off the black swatch. I can drag in a tint of this um, green. Like I can take this green and I can choose to tint it down to 10% and drag that swatch into InDesign so I have a 10% green swatch. And I can drag that to my gradient, right? All right. If you're in Illustrator, um, let me get my Illustrator file. If I click on the chicken, hold my control key down, edit original. Um, Illustrator gradients are actually extremely similar. 
there's a gradient, there's a gradient panel. Again, I can drag my light green swatch here. I can drag my light pink swatch here. I can pull off my black swatch and I've got a gradient um, right here. So that wouldn't affect the uh, printing at all, would it? Um, no, um, good question. So here, here's my artwork. I'm going to save my chicken now with that little gradient box on its face. Notice how it updated it because I went to edit original. And if we view this under window, um, output separation preview in InDesign, and I turn off the green, and I turn off the magenta, gradients don't affect it as long as you use spot colors. Okay? Okay. Um, any questions? No, that was a lot. So I